Hi, everyone. The time is uh, just about 6 p.m. Uh, we will give people a few more minutes to join the meeting. Uh, while we wait, I would like to introduce Chris Catbagan of the city of Santa Rosa and Arnica McCarthy of Caltrans to say a few words. Chris. Great, thank you, Oscar. Good evening, and welcome those for joining the city of Santa Rosa's virtual open house for the Santa Rosa U.S. Highway 101 bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing. Due to the widespread COVID-19 event, this community meeting provides the opportunity to use available technology to conduct an open house. Our previous open house during the environmental phase was held at Santa Rosa High School. Notifications for this virtual open house and circulation of draft environmental documents were distributed through emails, newsletters, social media, and city web pages. Hard copy mailers were sent to residents and property owners. I am Chris Cadbaggin. I'm an associate civil engineer with the Department of Transportation and Public Works at the city. I am the project manager. The city, along with CTS engineers as our design consultants, have been working to complete the environmental phase for this project. We've been in partnership with Sonoma County Transportation Authority, Caltrans, and our community with the objective of delivering this complex and duly needed project. As I mentioned before, Caltrans is a partner with the delivery of this project. Caltrans plays a critical role as the lead agency for the California Environmental Quality Act for this project. So therefore, I'd like to introduce Arnica McCarthy from Caltrans District Number 4. Arnica has been managing the environmental reviews at Caltrans. She's been helping the city move towards the completion of the environmental phase. Hi, Arnica. Hi, Chris. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Arnica McCarthy. I'm a senior environmental planner at Caltrans. I oversee the environmental process for transportation projects in Marin and Sonoma counties. As Chris mentioned, Caltrans is the lead agency under CEQA and NEPA, and we have been collaborating with the city and SCATA on this much needed bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing project. We are excited to see this project reach this point in the process and look forward to continuing to work with the city, SCTA, and the public to bring this project to life. This virtual community meeting is being held during the 30-day public comment period for the draft environmental document, which runs through July 24th, 2020. During this community meeting, we will take a few minutes to present the two build alternatives evaluated during the environmental process and open it up for questions. I would like to thank you for taking the time to participate in this community meeting and encourage you to provide written comments on the proposed project. Now I'd like to turn it over to Oscar for more information on the virtual meeting format and process. Thank you, Chris and Arnica. I too would like to welcome everyone to this online meeting for the Santa Rosa US Highway 101 Bicycle and Pedestrian Overcrossing Project. My name is Oscar and I'm joined by Jimmy. We are from SGA Architecture and Engineering and we will be the facilitators for this meeting. If any attendees would like to listen to this meeting in Spanish, we have an interpreter on a separate Spanish language conference line, which is being recorded. The number to call is on your screen. If there are any attendees on the Spanish language line now, please mute your telephone. We also have sign language interpreters for this online meeting, whose cameras will remain on. Before we begin, I would like to review the meeting format and Zoom features with you. We will start with an introduction of the panelists, followed by a 20 minute video slideshow presentation. 
after the video, we will go to a live session for questions and answers. After all questions have been answered, and if time permits it, the video presentation and live question and answer session will be repeated. If you have a question during this meeting, please click raise hand or the hand icon in the Zoom interface to be called on to speak during the question and answer session. If you're an English speaking attendee who has dialed into the meeting with your telephone, you can press star nine to raise hand. If you are a Spanish speaking attendee on the Spanish language line, please unmute your phone to let the interpreter know you have a question and mute your phone again. The interpreter will raise hand for you and ask you to speak during the question and answer period. If any attendees cannot find the raise hand button, please type your questions in the chat. Please take a moment to locate the raise hand button and the facilitators will see if there are any technical questions in the chat. Okay, seeing no more technical questions, this concludes our meeting format and technology review session. Now to begin tonight's meeting, I would like to introduce everyone to our panelists who will be taking your questions later. Would each panelist please say hello after they are announced. On your screen are Arnica McCarthy of Caltrans, Hello. Chris Katbaggin of the City of Santa Rosa. Good evening. Natalina Bernardi of BKF Engineers. Welcome, everyone. Stephen Grover of Stephen Grover and Associates Architecture and Engineering. Hi, everybody. And Will Burns of David J. Powers and Associates. Hello. Thank you, panelists. We will now hide everyone's cameras except for the sign language interpreters. A 20 minute video slideshow presentation will now begin, followed by a live question and answer session. Attendees on the Spanish language line will hear Spanish narration of the video. With the interpreter, please prepare the Spanish audio and let me know when you are ready. Looks like we are ready. Please start the video. Welcome to this online public meeting for the US Highway 101 Bicycle and Pedestrian Overcrossing Project. This project is a Caltrans and City of Santa Rosa project with Caltrans as the lead agency responsible for approving the project under the California Environmental Quality Act. In this public meeting, the project team will present findings from the project's draft environmental document, which began circulation on June 22 and is available for review and comment through July 24, 2020. Para escuchar esta presentación en español, marque 1-5-7-1-3-1-7-3-1-7. Y ingrese el código de acceso 307-830-877, numeral. The purpose of this meeting is to briefly describe the proposed project and its background. To inform the public about the circulation of the draft environmental document for review and comments between June 22nd and July 24th, 2020. To summarize the studies and findings of the document, to discuss the project schedule and next steps, to describe how to submit comments on the draft environmental document, and to answer any clarifying questions you might have about the document or project. 
Following this recorded slideshow presentation, we will go to a live session, and panelists from the project team will answer any questions that would provide clarity about the information presented. Please note that formal comments about the project or draft environmental document cannot be received during the question and answer period since all formal comments must be submitted in writing. The proposed bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing project is located along US 101 between the Steel Lane and College Avenue interchanges and two build alternative alignments approximately 0.25 mile apart were evaluated in the draft environmental document. The Edwards Elliott build alternative would connect Edwards Avenue on the west, which borders the southerly end of Cottingtown Mall, to Elliott Avenue on the east, which borders the northerly end of Santa Rosa Junior College, or SRJC. The Bear Cub Way build alternative would cross from the Myers Restaurant Supply parking lot south of Foley Street on the west to a parking lot on Bear Cub Way on the east in the SRJC campus. Note that during the feasibility study phase, a Jennings Avenue alignment was also considered but was ruled out as non-viable due to conflicts with existing residential uses. Both the Edwards Elliott and the Bear Cub Way build alternatives being considered would fulfill a key project goal of closing a gap in the existing and planned bicycle and pedestrian transportation network in Santa Rosa. In 1994, the City of Santa Rosa identified the need for improved pedestrian and bicycle access across US 101 in the vicinity of Steel Lane and included the US 101 Bicycle and Pedestrian Overcrossing Project in the City's Bicycle and Pedestrian Master Plan as a high priority project. Freeway bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing projects such as this one typically pass through four planning and design phases. One, feasibility study. Two, project initiation. Three, project approval and environmental documentation, and finally four, plans, specifications, and estimates. In 2010, the feasibility study was completed by the city and accepted by the city council. Then in 2016, the city completed the project initiation document, which was formally reviewed and approved by Caltrans. Currently, we are nearing the end of the project approval and environmental documentation phase. As part of the environmental process, this public meeting is being conducted while the project's draft environmental document is circulated for public review and comments. In order to document the environmental impacts that may result from the project, Caltrans has prepared an initial study and plans to adopt a mitigated negative declaration that details the potential impacts of the project and strategies to avoid, minimize, and mitigate those potential impacts. One of the first steps to define the project is to identify the purpose and need. The purpose of this project is to provide a safer and more enjoyable alternative for bicyclists and pedestrians crossing US 101 in the vicinity of SRJC compared to existing highway crossings, and provide a continuous ADA compliant path to improve pedestrian and bicycle east-west connectivity across US 101 in the northern half of the city of Santa Rosa and connecting to the existing and proposed bicycle and pedestrian networks. The need for the project is to accommodate and provide safe access to bicyclists and pedestrians in areas east and west of the freeway. Currently, bicyclists and pedestrians wanting to access regional facilities such as Cottingtown Mall and SRJC from opposite sides of the freeway must cross at Guerneville Road and Steel Lane or College Avenue. Both of these existing freeway interchanges are heavily congested with vehicular traffic, making them less inviting for bicyclists and pedestrians.
In order to address the project need discussed in the previous slide, the project proposes a Class 1 17-foot wide bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing of US 101 following either the Edwards Elliott build alternative or the Bear Cub Way build alternative. The design of the overcrossing would comply with requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act and would allow for a 5-foot wide walking lane and an 8-foot wide bicycle path with possible mode separation delineated by a concrete curb. Both the Edwards Elliott and the Bear Cub Way build alternatives would facilitate connections to key origins and destinations on the west side of the freeway, including bicycle and pedestrian routes, residential areas, the North Santa Rosa Station of the Sonoma Marin Area Rail Transit District, also known as SMART, the SMART Multi-Use Pathway, Cottingtown Mall, Cleveland Avenue, and the Jennings Avenue Bike Boulevard. Both build alternatives would also facilitate connections on the east side of the freeway, such as the SRJC campus, Santa Rosa High School, Ridgeway High School, Mendocino Avenue, and destinations further east. For the Edwards Elliott build alternative, the proposed overcrossing would be accessed on the west side via a touchdown adjacent to Dick's Sporting Goods on Edwards Avenue. The existing bus stop on Edwards Avenue near Dick Sporting Goods would be relocated further east on Edwards Avenue to a location just west of Cleveland Avenue. On the east side, the proposed overcrossing would be accessed via a touchdown area adjacent to Elliott Avenue. This build alternative would require the removal of two SRJC buildings and the relocation of approximately four portable buildings owned by SRJC from the south side of Elliott Avenue. The crossing would be illuminated at night, provide ample width to allow for cyclists and pedestrians to travel at different desired speeds, and ramp up on each side at gentle slopes, compliant with requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Note that the Edwards Elliott Build alternative does not propose any changes to the existing roadway network and would not result in the closure of Elliott Avenue at its intersection with Armory Drive on the east side of US 101. Two visualizations on this slide illustrate how the Edwards Elliott build alternative would appear to a driver traveling along US 101 in the northbound and southbound directions. These visualizations represent the asymmetric cable stayed structure type proposed for the project, with the structural tower located on the east side of Armory Drive. Additional structural supports would be located in the landscaped area between the freeway and Cleveland Avenue and west of Cleveland Avenue along Edwards Avenue. For the Bear Cub Way build alternative, the proposed overcrossing would be accessed on the west side via a touchdown adjacent to Range Avenue and a second access point at Cleveland Avenue. The aerial portion of the approach pathway would span over a private parking lot for Myers Restaurant Supply. The west approach also includes a landing at the approximate halfway point to facilitate connecting to both Range Avenue and Cleveland Avenue. On the east side, the proposed overcrossing would be accessed via a touchdown area adjacent to the existing Call Child Development Center on the SRJC campus. The project would require a reconfiguration of the SRJC parking lot and a permanent public easement along Bear Cub Way to provide for public access all the way to Mendocino Avenue. As with the build alternative at Edwards Elliott, the crossing would be illuminated at night, provide ample width to allow for cyclists and pedestrians to travel at different desired speeds, and ramp up on each side at gentle slopes, compliant with the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The two visualizations on this slide illustrate how the Bear Cub Way build alternative would appear to a driver traveling along US 101 in the northbound and southbound directions. 
these visualizations represent the asymmetric cable stayed structure type proposed for the project with the structural tower located on the east side of Armory Drive. Additional structural supports would be located just west of Cleveland Avenue within the Myers Restaurant Supply parking lot and just east of Armory Drive within the SRJC parking lot on Bear Cub Way. This project is currently undergoing environmental review to comply with the National Environmental Policy Act, also known as NEPA, and the California Environmental Quality Act, also known as CEQA. The initial phase of the environmental review process involved a design team reviewing the build alternatives that were studied during the project initiation phase. Further design refinements were made to each build alternative and technical studies were prepared to analyze the potential environmental impacts of the proposed design. Throughout the environmental review process, meetings have been held with local stakeholders, including SRJC. A public scoping meeting was also held in March 2018 at Santa Rosa High School. A public survey was also posted online following the public scoping meeting, which received over 100 responses. Under NEPA, the project has been determined to qualify for a categorical exclusion because its actions do not have a significant effect on the human environment or the procedures adopted by a federal agency necessary to implement NEPA regulations. An initial study and proposed mitigated negative declaration, or ISMND, have been prepared for the project to comply with CEQA. And it is this ISMND that is the document that is currently being circulated for a 30-day public review period. As previously stated, this community meeting is intended to inform the public of the availability of the ISMND for review and comment. Following conclusion of the public comment period, all comments received will be reviewed and a final environmental document will be prepared. A variety of technical reports were prepared for the project to identify and analyze potential impacts of each build alternative and to propose avoidance, minimization measures, and mitigation measures for each impact. The technical reports analyze the potential for impacts, including but not limited to air quality, biological resources, the community, including low income and minority populations, geology, greenhouse gas emissions, hazards and hazardous materials, hydrology and water quality, noise and vibration, paleontology, and visual impacts. This project contains project features or best management practices, which are standard on all Caltrans jobs and are evaluated as part of the scope of the project to comply with Caltrans' standards and guidelines, as well as federal and state laws. To further reduce impacts specifically related to this project, the ISMND identifies avoidance and minimization measures, as well as mitigation measures that will be implemented to avoid and or reduce project impacts to less than significant levels under CEQA. Avoidance and minimization measures are included in the project to avoid impacts related but not limited to views of the project, biological resources, cultural resources, greenhouse gas emissions, hazards and hazardous materials, hydrology and water quality, paleontological resources, and transportation. Additionally, avoidance and minimization measures have also been included in the project to address construction noise, and mitigation measures are included in the project to address elevated vibration levels during project construction. The draft environmental document began circulation on June 22, 2020, and will be available for public review and comment until July 24, 2020. During this period, formal comments will be accepted. 
After review of public comments, the final environmental document will be published in the fall of this year and include responses to comments. Caltrans may decide to move forward with all or part of the proposed project or decide on the no-build alternative. As mentioned earlier, the project is nearing the end of the project approval and environmental documentation phase, and this public meeting is being conducted while the project's draft environmental document is circulated for public review. After analyzing public comments, all or part of the preferred alternative or the no-build alternative will be selected, followed by the preparation and approval of the final environmental document, which will conclude this project phase. Design development will follow, and construction of the project is dependent on the city obtaining grant funding. The ISMND or draft environmental document is currently available for review and comments. To receive a hard copy or CD of the draft environmental document, please email Elizabeth Nagel at elizabeth.nagle at dot.ca.gov with your request. Copies are available for download from Caltrans's website at the link provided in this presentation. The document can also be found online by searching for Caltrans District 4 Environmental Documents. The public is encouraged to review the draft environmental document and to provide comments in writing. Comments can be submitted in three ways by postal mail to Elizabeth Nagel at 111 Grand Avenue in Oakland, California, zip code 94612, or by email to elizabeth.nagle at dot.ca.gov, or via the webinar chat for this online public meeting. Comments must be postmarked by July 24th, 2020. Thank you for watching this video presentation on the US Highway 101 Bicycle and Pedestrian Overcrossing Project in Santa Rosa. The public meeting will now go to live session for questions and answers with panelists Arnica McCarthy of Caltrans, Chris Catbaggin of Santa Rosa, Natalina Bernardi of BKF Engineers, Stephen Grover of Stephen Grover & Associates, and Will Burns of David J. Powers & Associates. Welcome back, everyone. We are now in the live question and answer portion of the meeting. And we will show the cameras for our panelists. If you have a question, please click the raise hand or hand icon in the Zoom interface to be called on to speak. If you're an English speaking attendee who has dialed into the meeting with your telephone, you can press star nine to raise hand. If you're a Spanish speaking attendee on the Spanish language line, please unmute your phone to let the interpreter know you have a question and mute your phone again. The interpreter will raise hand for you and call on you to speak. If anyone cannot find the raise hand button, please type your questions in the chat. Please note that during this question and answer session, the panelists can only take clarifying questions. As stated in the video, formal comments about the project must be submitted in writing by postal mail, email, or typed in the chat. We will now open the meeting to questions, and I would like to remind attendees and panelists to pause after each sentence for the interpreters and to speak slowly. Okay, I see that Janet Barocco 
has raised their hand, I will now unmute them and allow them to speak. Uh, Janet, if you can hear me, yes, can uh, you, you may ask your question. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. You're a little bit faint, though. Okay, I'll try to speak up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the Jennings Bicycle Boulevard in the comments, and um, also that the Jennings Crossing was, um, what is the word? It was ruled out because of, I think you said, residential conflicts. I'm not sure if I got that right. But my question is, how does the Jennings Bicycle Boulevard figure into either of these proposed um, bridges over the 101? Okay, thank you, Janet. Um, I believe that question it could be for Stephen Grover of Stephen Grover and Associates. Thank you. Um, Oscar, could you, or Jimmy, could you go to the slide which has the bicycle and pedestrian network? Great, so in red here, we can see the Jennings um, alignment, uh, the Jen Jennings Street, I'm just gonna mark it. It's here. Um, so I think there were kind of two parts of the question. One is, uh, why was this alternative eliminated? Uh, there were substantial conflicts with existing uh, residential uh, development on both sides of Jenning uh, near Cleveland, uh, such that driveways would be blocked and parking would be eliminated. Um, the two alternatives that, uh, build alternatives that remain under consideration uh, would be able to connect to Jennings via range and ditto via range. Does that answer your question? Um, it does, except that one of the um, objectives, of, at least my understanding of today's project, is that you wish to connect the west side with the east side and it seems to me that those bicyclists and pedestrians that live west of the railroad tracks will now have to cross at Guerneville Road or West College to access um, the 101 bridge. And um, there's, for years we have, as you may know, um, that's another issue, but we have fought to get this and had had the Jennings crossing okay so it feels like to me it's eliminating we're still going to have to cross those dangerous crossings that's my concern mm -hmm. Chris can you uh, speak to that uh, Chris you'll have to unmute yourself there we go right I think I should first start out that uh I appreciate your, your question. Um, the Jennings Crossing is an entirely different project. These environmental studies aren't meant for that Jennings Crossing. I think that Jennings Crossing went through its own environmental process. So basically Jennings Avenue crossing uh, the railroad, that's its own project. And so these are, that is a standalone project. And so if you'd like, uh, you can contact me outside the meeting and I can redirect you to the project manager of that project. But again, the crossing and uh, the overcrossing that we're presenting today and that Jennings crossing aren't the same project. This meeting is for this project, the overcrossing. Does that help? 
Yeah, I mean, I understand that, but it again, it doesn't it doesn't help us on the west side. So I guess we'll just have to be crossing over that Guerneville area. But thank you. Yeah, it's pretty obvious to me. I mean, if you could tell me the uh, the project manager uh, for that. Sure. Um, I'll leave my contact information in the chat and you can go ahead and contact me. Great. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you, Janet. I will uh, now lower your hand. Okay. It also looks like we have a question from Rick uh, Coates or Cody's. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. I will now unmute you. Uh, let's see. There, I think you should be able to speak now. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, for the record, it's Coates. Oh, and, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Um, I have actually three questions. The first is in the environmental document uh, when traffic is discussed, are you using level of service or vehicle miles traveled? Uh, that's one question. Uh, I noticed you mentioned the acquisition of property. Um, does that entail eminent domain? That's the second question. And uh, uh, I'll wait for the answers for those before I try another one. Okay. It's uh, the first one seemed to be about VMTs. Uh, I'll direct that to Will Burns of David J. Powers and Associates. Yes, so since this is a bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing, it's not going to have, I mean, any negative impact related to VMT or LOS. Of course, the hope is that with this additional crossing that allows people to use other modes of travel that um, VMT overall would be reduced and conversely LOS as well um, at local intersections. But given the nature of the project uh, there there isn't really any impact to um, either vmt or los that and didn't then, really answer my question <laughs> the question is which did you use if any there was no quantified study of either uh, los or vmt as part of the environmental review since the project okay. would not add any additional um, vehicular trips to the roadway network in the vicinity of the bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there would be some right-of-way take and that is uh, detailed in the environmental document. Uh, I think maybe Arnica you might be better able to um, address you know how that process works through Caltrans. Yeah, um, thanks. This is Arnica from Caltrans. Um, so once we are finished with the environmental um, process and we have decided on a preferred alternative and uh, have a signed project report at Caltrans, we'll move into the design phase of the project. Um, and within the design phase, um, we'll start refining what the the actual impacts are to um, public and private property and uh, the our we have a, a very talented staff of right-of-way agents who will work with the individual property owners um, during design phase to acquire um, any any land uh, that is needed to build the alternative th that we end up moving forward with that also doesn't quite directly answer my question whether you would resort to eminent domain if necessary. Um, eminent domain is uh, always a last resort that is available, um, but it is a last resort and um, in my experience at Caltrans I have seen us make modifications to project designs where we could um, avoid take when we didn't have a willing seller. Okay, and um, my final question is, uh, have you decided upon a preferred op option here? 
Um, have you chosen between the two as, as one to recommend? We have not. We studied both alternatives um, and there are pros and cons, uh, different levels of impacts, pros and cons. We're looking for feedback from the community. Um, if you have a preferred alternative, I would definitely encourage you to put that in writing and share it with us. Um, and just to kind of, sorry, um, to further that is uh, a decision that will be made in coordination with uh, the project development team at Caltrans, the city of Santa Rosa, and um, SCTA after the public comment period has ended and we have reviewed all of the comments um, and uh, that that's when that decision is made. So it's made, we'll, uh, our final environmental document will include uh, which of the alternatives we selected and why. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for your questions. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I will now lower your hand. Oh, you did lower your hand. Okay. Um, I see that a question came through the chat. It is from a Manoa Haviland. Her question is, or his question is, why is the Bear Cub Way build alternative more expensive than the Edwards Elliott build alternative? Um, I will first direct this to uh, Natalina of BKF Engineers. Yes, um, there's primarily there's more right away involved with the Bear Cub uh, alternative, um, as well as it's a lo longer span. So those two um, items uh, contribute to the overall cost. It makes it more expensive than Edwards and Elliott. Uh, there's also more reconstruction recon reconstruction work involved in the parking lots at Myers and uh, the Bear Cub Way. Um, parking lot. So all those are contributing factors. I hope that answered your question, Manoa. I'll take a raised hand now. I see a raised hand from Eris Weaver. I will unmute you. Hi. Um, I, I have to say, I'm a, uh, so far nothing that you've presented is something that we haven't already seen in other meetings and presentations. And the, the uh, flyer for this meeting said that we would learn about the, the draft environmental document. And so I guess I was anticipating some more discussion and presentation about some of the details that are actually in that 127-page document that Los I detalles que están en had a chance to read. Um, so I guess uh, the best question I can come up with on that would be, can you give a short summary of um, uh, any particular um, standout environmental issues and mitigations, particularly if there are significant differences between the two alternatives um, from either of those points of view? Um, and then my second question would be, uh, you've mentioned a no-build alternative, which, um, I mean, we've been talking about this project and it's been in the, in, you know, in so many plans for so many years that I was actually, I'm like horrified to even hear that being put out there as an option after all of this to not build anything at all. So I'd like to hear that addressed. Okay. Thank you, Eris. Uh, with the question, first question about the draft environmental document, I will direct that to Will of David J. Powers and Associates. Yeah, th thanks for the question. Um, I think the, the primary environmental impact that's been identified in the initial study is the potential for there to be uh, construction vibration that causes a disturbance during the construction period of the project. Uh, there is mitigation included, which is a um, vibration mitigation plan. And in that there are standards identified um, under which various buildings adjacent to either alternative would be uh, given further study to ensure that there were no negative impacts uh, 
to both the structure and the operations of those uh, uses. So that's, that's the primary impact. Um, there are a lot of project features that are standard measures that Caltrans requires on all of their projects. And there are other um, avoidance and minimization measures that have been incorporated into the uh, design of the project. Um, on the whole, I think the, the two alignments, they're, they're pretty similar in terms of their potential for impacts. And, and the goal has really been to um, avoid impacts through the design of the project to the extent feasible. Does that answer your question? It addresses my first question somewhat. The second one is about the no build option. So the no build option is a is a standard option. You know, there could be such um, community concern regarding both of the alternatives that the city and Caltrans decides that neither of these alternatives is appropriate. Um, based on your comment, it sounds like you're you're in favor of uh, at least one of the alternatives being constructed. So I, I think the no build is kind of a, a, a last resort. All right, Hello. thank you, Eris. I will lower your hand. Okay. Um, I see a, uh, a just a comment from Chris. Uh, hold on here. Okay, never mind. Somebody is replying there regarding a technical issue. Um, I see a raised hand from Frank Haig. I will allow you to talk. Frank, uh, if you unmute yourself on mute can you hear me no. hi frank you may ask your question can you hear me yes we can all right let's go to the slide that shows the edwards avenue uh, project and then i have a question about that okay i see it here and my home is right across from the exporting goods I'm at 970 Edwards Avenue. I'm concerned about access to our driveway and the impact that that construction will have on, uh, on our property. Is, Frank, is this like a comment or a question? That's a question, yes. What impact will that have? The construction impacts of the project in that area. Uh, I will direct this question to Will of David J. Powers and Associates. So uh, I mentioned project features um, in my last response. And um, one of those project features that Caltrans requires is a traffic management plan. So that um, would be developed as you get closer to construction and uh, within that plan, they'll be addressing ensuring access to uh, all adjacent uses during the construction period. So that's when that uh, would really be detailed and, and worked through in terms of um, how they're planning to provide access. I think uh, the project has been designed to, you know, minimize any disruption to um, the various land uses adjacent to either alternative. So the intent is to, you know, is to continue to allow access to your, to the various properties and, and there shouldn't be um, any issue for you having access to your residence during construction. Okay, I understand that, but I'm also concerned about construction equipment and other kinds of, of uh, construction people on that site at Edwards Avenue, right across from Dick's Sporting Goods. Can you talk about that so the um, staging areas for that 
section of the project are going to be located on the north side of Edwards Avenue. So they wouldn't be um, storing, you know, construction materials on the south side. You know, the intent is to keep as much of the um, construction activity and equipment away from sensitive uses such as, you know, residential areas that are present on the south side of Edwards Avenue. So that's definitely on uh, the project team's radar and, and something that they're going to actively seek to avoid. Okay, I understand that, but that means then that you are going to be using Dick's Sporting Goods parking lot for your staging area. Is that correct? Uh, the, the current intent is to keep all construction staging within the um, public right-of-way, so that would be on Edwards Avenue um, and, and not having an effect on the actual parking areas within Dick's Sporting Goods. So what does that uh, impact have on access to that parking area there at Dick's Sporting Goods? Yeah, there will continue to be access uh, off of Cleveland Avenue and um, very, uh, you know, if there might be times where there's some closure of the access from Edwards, uh, but that would be, again, limited to, to the extent feasible. Okay, my last question then is, you're going to take and move that bus stop that's there uh, right across from Dick Sporting Goods, and you're gonna move it westward? You know whereabouts? So during construction, the plan is to move it um, in front of the apartment building. I believe it's called Los Robles Apartment. Yeah. Okay, I know where that is. Yeah, and then the permanently it would be relocated to be closer to the um, Edwards Avenue intersection with Cleveland Avenue. Well, you're going to move it down to uh, Cleveland Avenue. It's going to be closer. It's going to be on Edwards Avenue still, but closer to the Patelco building. Okay, I see the relo relocated bus stop. That's where you're going to... Okay. Right. I think that's most of my questions right now. I'm concerned about the construction when it starts, where they're going to be heavy equipment and the ground is starting to shake. You know, we feel earthquakes once in a while around here. And I'm just wondering if that's going to have a problem with cracks in my home. Yeah, so that's something that will be looked at in um, greater detail as the design moves forward. Um, there are measures in the initial study to review all the structures that might have a, you know, potentially be impact, um, you know, either due to annoyance or actual cracking um, in buildings. So they will be, they will be looking at that. Well, that's fine that you're going to be looking at it, but what are you going to do to mitigate it? Uh, may I speak to that? Sure. Um, we've located the main structural tower on the east side. Um, so that's where the primary deep foundation would be. Uh, and um, in the vicinity of your residence, uh, the structure would be on retaining walls. So we would not expect deep foundations or piles or anything like that near your house. Well then what are those red dots along the way there on the, in the, on the, the main span? What are those piers that are holding up the span? Those are piers. They're, they would not be the same, um, the same type of foundation as would be needed for the tower, though. But yes, they are, they are piers, and they would need foundations, substantial foundations. But there will, there will be some ground shaking when those are installed. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, depending on the type of foundation we use, if it's a drilled shaft, then you would not expect ground shaking. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Good luck. And this is Arnica. Um, I just want to add on, and um, one of the ways that within the environmental document that we have recommended um, addressing potential unforeseen issues um, for somewhere such as yourself is to have a contact person in case um, uh, issues do arise during construction. 
Thank you, Frank. Um, if you have other comments that you would like to submit regarding this project, please do so in writing as a response to the environmental document. Um, let's see, I just want to check, did, is, I see a raised hand from a Wayne Sel Seden, Seden, sorry if I mispronounced that, I will uh, unmute you. Uh, Wayne, if you would unmute yourself, you can ask your question. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Uh, um, my question is uh, with regard to uh, the involvement by the uh, junior college. It seems to me that I've heard that they are mainly in favor of the Edwards uh, Elliott route. Uh, gives them better access to the shopping mall as well as the uh, train station at uh, the, that location. And it also seems like um, um, it just uh, generally the flow of traffic and the numbers of uh, people who would be using that route would be much larger than it would be for the other alternative. Um, can you comment as to what has been the involvement by the uh, Santa Rosa Junior College? Uh, I will direct that question to Natalina Bernardi of BKF Engineers. Yes, um, well, both the Edwards Elliott Build Alternative and the Bear Cub Way Alternative affect the junior college. So we have had discussions with them, um, showing them both alternatives and uh, what would be needed in order to uh, construct each alternative. Uh, they, they have not formally weighed in as to an alternative that they're in favor of, but as you mentioned, they did indicate that Edwards and Elliott does provide connectivity to uh, a, a lot of point sources such as County Town and also um, their future uh, student housing center. So that's been the conversation today concerning uh, the junior college's preference or at least discussions. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, I hope that answered your question. If uh, you have an additional question, please raise your hand. I'm going to look in the chat to see if there's other questions. We have a question from Sarah Jones. Uh, she says, are any trees going to re be removed on the SRJC campus? Uh, I'll direct that question to Will Burns of David J. Powers and Associates. Uh, yes, there would be some tree removal required uh, for either alternative with the Edwards Elliott Avenue alternative. Um, on the SRJC campus specifically, I believe it's seven trees that are gonna require removal. Uh, a few of those are um, what would be uh, native trees. And then on the um, Bear Cub Way alternative, there would also be five trees removed on the SRJC campus. Again, some of those are, you know, what would be considered native trees, valley oak, live oak. Um, but to the extent feasible, you know, these, have been, these alignments have been chosen to avoid trees and uh, the trees that are being removed with Edwards and Elliott, uh, they're closer to the, uh, I think I would say the southeast corner of that intersection of Armory and Elliott. Um, and then with the Bear Cub Way, they're it, it, within that parking lot on the SRGC campus. It's the, the tree removal has been minimized and there would be replacement trees planted as part of the landscaping plan though. Thank you, Will. Sarah, I hope that answered your question. I'll take a raised hand. I see it, Elizabeth Ridlington. Uh, I will unmute you. Elizabeth, you can ask your question now. Thank you. I think my question is somewhat a follow up on Wayne's question, and it might be beyond the scope of this document, but I'm wondering if the city or as part of the analysis here has looked into trip generation and desired destinations on either side for each alignment as part of the process of thinking about which crossing is the better one to serve the most people. 
I live on the north end of the JC, and so the Elliott Ave crossing is more appealing to me, but I'm thinking about there's a lot of students who need to get to the high school, and so how many, for how many people is the southern alignment more attractive because it provides easy access from residential areas on the west side over to the high school, for example. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, in terms of where people are going, maybe I'll direct that question to Stephen Grover of Stephen Grover and Associates, Architecture and Engineering. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, that's a, um, uh, first of all, to answer your question, uh, the, the short answer is we have not done any formal numerical uh, analyses. Um, however, we have studied this uh, quite a bit and uh, worked uh, to understand anecdotally what different people need in the community as we work through all the community uh, meetings. Um, we do think that one of the main drivers of people using this project would be the smart station and um, the connection between the smart station and the JC. So now that the smart station is up where it is uh, nearer to the Edwards Elliott location, uh, there's probably more trips that would be generated uh, by the connection to SMART uh, for the northern option. Uh, with regard to the high school, we did not hear a lot of interest um, from parents or students uh, about people wanting to use a crossing uh, to access the high school. Uh, another factor that I think uh, has played in is there's been a lot of new residential development on the west side and we think that that will generate uh, users uh, for either uh, of these options. Uh, we didn't think that there would be a strong uh, preference for either the northern or the southern Edwards Elliott or Bear Cub. Uh, one more factor is of course uh, well, I'll say two more factors. Um, most of the pedestrian activity on the SRJC campus um, is concentrated on the northern part of the campus. The southern part is primarily bare, um, playing fields. And the other um, uh, significant attractor would be Cottingtown, which is also towards the north. So on balance, uh, it's just my personal opinion that you would probably see more trips, um, more usage uh, for the Edwards Elliott location. Elizabeth, thanks for that question. I will now lower your hand. Okay, I see, uh, I see in the chat, um, uh, John, are you John Sutter, uh, if, you're, if you're calling in, you can press star nine to uh, raise your hand. Uh, we can't match you to your number. You can also type in the last four digits of your telephone number. That could help us find out um, which call in attendee you are. In the meantime, I'll take a raised hand here from Erica Asimov. Let me unmute you, Erica. Erica? Yes, hi. Good question. Yeah, so um, I too live on Edwards Avenue, just like Frank does, and have some um, lots of concerns about this, this bridge. Um, and I'm wondering, does Bear Cub have any residential housing? over where the path is gonna be, or the expected path. Uh, I will direct that question to uh, Stephen Grover of SGA Architecture and Engineering.
Uh, Stephen, you are on mute. Let me. Okay. Okay. There you go. At one point, we understood the SRJC was considering housing uh, on the southern part of their campus. Uh, we are, it's our understanding that they're no longer considering that and that they're locating housing, uh, new housing at the corner of Armory and Elliott. Okay, so, so basically there is no residential housing at the Bear location, the Bear Cub. Correct. So like Jennings, where you guys had decided not to use that because of residents, wouldn't it also be a good idea probably not to affect the residents? Because I see this bridge as being a really impactful project for those of us that literally live across the street on Edwards Avenue. Um, and it's gonna change the aesthetic view. I mean, the lights that are gonna be on all night long, the additional traffic, there's no traffic light at uh, Edwards in Cleveland and there's no traffic light at Range and Edwards. Um, so it just sounds like it's gonna cause a lot more problems for the residents in that area. Um, the people, you know, more people coming up around at night. Um, so I'm, I'm just c wondering why that was chosen as a location. I mean. I understand for ease, but why those residents weren't taken into consideration. Um, I realize a lot of the housing around here is low income, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't affect us as well. Um, having, you know, a, a bridge be put literally across the street from our house. So I'm curious why we were not looked into as, you know, that it being out extremely impactful for those of us that live here. I would, I would encourage you to submit um, these, a lot of what you're saying, I would call comments. Um, so I, I would also, um, I just want to mention that we did extensive public outreach and community meetings over the last um, many years, uh, 13 years since I've been involved. Um, so we, we do very much appreciate your comments and your perspectives, and we will take them very seriously as we uh, consider them in the final environmental review process. All right, thank you. Thank you, Erica. Let me just lower your hand here. Okay. Uh, I have another hand raised here from Derek Robertson. Derek, let me unmute you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Derek. Great, I just have one comment. I would oh, like to say- oh, Comment, Derek? Comments yes. should be submitted in writing or typed into the chat. Uh, if you wanna ask a question of the panelists, you can do so. Oh, uh, my comment in the form of a question is, why haven't we built this awesome bridge before? <laughs> uh, that question I will direct to Chris. Uh, um, I appreciate the enthusiasm. I will say that, uh, again, this is a special project delivery process that involves Caltrans. So we have to go through Caltrans right of way, which activates them to uh, adhere to their permitting uh, process. And so that's why we are moving along with this environmental phase. We have uh, executed a feasibility study and here we are in the environmental phase. Um, if or when we get past this environmental phase, uh, we should be heading to design. Uh, we already have uh, federal funded uh, money allocated for the design phase, and then uh, we can go to construction. So right now, our objective is to get an environmental clearance within the end of the year. So we can move forward to the design phase. Understood. Thank you very much. Thank you, Derek. Let me lower your hand. Okay. In the chat, I see a question from Rick Coates. Uh, he asks, who will pay for the deconstruction of the JC buildings, the city or SRJC? Uh, I will direct that question to Chris. Of the Sorry, can, you can you repeat that question? I didn't quite hear you. Rick Coates asked, who will pay for the deconstruction of the JC building? 
the city or SRJC? Uh, I don't, uh, you know what, can anybody uh, begin the answer to this question? I just want to make sure I'm on the right path there. Chris, do you want me to take it? This is Natalina. Please. Yeah, so if those buildings need to be brought down due to our project, it's a project cost. So it'll be, a tr the cost of doing so will be attributed to this project. Um, we did mention that there's a future SRJC housing project. Depending upon timing, if that project requires those buildings to be taken down, then it would be on the uh, student housing project. So it's, it's a little bit based on timing and when, which, when the project gets there, who has the need to take those buildings down. Okay. Thank you, Natalina. Uh, Rick, I hope that answered your question. Uh, let me just take a moment to check. Um, let's see, I saw earlier, perhaps there's a, is there a Spanish question? Okay, no. All right, uh, I see, let me see, John. John, uh, hopefully you can dial star nine on your phone or uh, write your question in the chat. In the meantime, let me take a raised hand uh, from, oh, actually, let's see. Let me, John, this is, this might be you, let me see. Hello. John? Yeah, hi, this is John Sutter on uh, Victor Drive, um, just north of the junior college. Uh, yes, you may ask your question. Okay. Um, uh, I was, <laughs> just yesterday, I was walking my dogs on Bear Cub Drive, and I was told by the campus police I was not allowed to do that because that's private campus, uh, that's part of the junior college. Um, he maintained that's not a public street. Are you aware of that? Uh, I, will, um, I will direct that question to uh, Natalina Bernardi. Uh, yes, in the, in the Bear Cub Way build alternative, we have accounted for uh, requiring right-of-way easements in order to make the alignment of the bridge as well as the pathway from the bridge to Mendocino Drive public accessible. So the cost of Bear Cub Way Build Alternative considers the need for that. Okay, can I ask another question? Uh, yes, you may. Um, are the planners there aware that the college is planning on closing Elliott, um, pretty much where the cross light is? Um, between the northern part of the campus and the main part of the campus? I'll direct that second question to Chris. Hi. I will say that SRJC um, has called that project uh, the pilot program. Basically, it doesn't close the entire length of of Elliot, it closed a portion of it. Um, I will say that's a, another uh, standalone project. It doesn't affect our project. I know right now um, there was a, an open house held by the SRJC. And um, again, they're going through their own environmental process, hoping to get clearance. I know they're working with uh, uh, the city of Santa Rosa's uh, Department of Transportation on that. And so we are aware that um, they are from uh, the last pieces of information I received that there were studies being done. I'm not sure if they've been submitted, but I know there's ongoing conversations. Um, 
so that if that happens, and I can just about guarantee you it will once the JC sets their mind to it, um, that that study will become quite permanent. Um, but as far as pedestrians, there are many, many, many more pedestrians on Elliott than there are on Bear Cub. Bear Cub is essentially an alley with absolutely no residents looking out. And ha have you considered uh, which one is going to be more friendly to pedestrians in the nighttime? I will direct that question to Stephen Grover of SGA Architecture and Engineering. That question is near and dear to me because we think a lot about how to make things um, pedestrian friendly. I'm the chair of the Pedestrian Advisory Committee for Caltrans District 4. Um, and in the design for this project for both alternatives, um, we took a very hard look at uh, not just uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety, but also the pedestrian user experience. So um, we're very concerned with the path of travel, but also the touchdown areas where pedestrians will mix with other um, cyclists, pedestrians, and ultimately vehicular traffic. Um, the short answer is yes, we, we look at that a lot and we look forward to, if the project moves forward, um, working to um, refine the design in a way that makes it as inviting, friendly, and comfortable as possible for pedestrians. Okay, thank you. Um, are you aware that the bond money uh, that the uh, uh, JC has um, uh, one of the allocations is for demolition of the Lucius Button building. So it, it's slated to be removed no matter what. Is there, uh, John, is that a specific question related to this? Uh, yeah, are you aware of that? That would have, to me, that's going to be a savings of a considerable amount of money. Uh, if, this, if the college dem demolishes it instead of having to wrap it into the project. Are you aware of that? Uh, I'll direct that question to Will of David J. Powers and Associates. Um, that is not something that we are aware of, but I think as um, Natalina or the was considered as in part of the environmental review. Um, I think as Natalina indicated in her response to a, to a prior question, um, whichever project comes along first that requires the removal of um, the buildings along Elliott Avenue that would be taken out, um, they would be responsible for removing them at that point. Thank you. And I have to make one comment. I love that representation of the bridge be behind Arnica, and I can't wait to get my Jungle Gym um, adventure hat on to cross um, 101 on that bridge. Thank you, John. Uh, let me just lower your hand. Uh, we have a related question. It's from Chris Zagorowitz in the chat. He asks, or she asks, do you know which buildings will come down, uh, presumably on the SRJC campus? I will direct that question to uh, Natalina Bernardi of BKF Engineers. So Chris, I, I hope you could see the visual that's up on the screen. And with that, you'll see the buildings that'll be needed to be demolished as part of the Edwards and Elliott build alternative on the SRJC campus with an X. So the building closest to Elliott and Armory intersection on the southeast corner will need to be removed. And then as we move further east, uh, just east of Illinois, there's 
uh, another building uh, that will be needed to be removed. And then there's several portables that are located directly east of the, cor the building at the corner of Elliott and Armory. Those, those portables closest to Elliott would need to be removed in order to allow for the construction and um, the actual build out of Edwards Elliott alternative. So the buildings will be isolated on SRJC campus and those closest to Armory. Thank you, Natalina. I hope that answered your question, Chris. Let me take a raised hand uh, from Wayne Seddon again. Wayne, let me unmute you. Uh, yes, uh, the question I had was uh, with regard to uh, potential cost differences between the alternative routes. Has there been any rough estimates of what the cost might be between those two? Thank you, Wayne. I will direct that question to Natalina Bernardi of BKF Engineers. Uh, yes, um, we have done just rough estimates because this is in preliminary stage. Uh, the, esti the estimates of each of the alternative are similar um, not, and not tremendously different between one alternative and another. Uh, Thank you, Wayne. I hope that answered your question. Uh, let me take another raised hand here from Robert Peterson. Robert, let me unmute you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Robert, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, great. I, I just want to say I'm glad you're building this. Uh, I was in a bicycle accident last year at, in the Cottingtown area, riding home from work at the junior college uh, to the west side, and I'm glad you're actually doing this. It's going to save lives, and it's going to be much better for people. But my question is, where is the funding coming from? Is it coming from the gas tax that we've all been paying, this extra gas tax that we've stated a few years ago, or where is the funding coming from? Thank you, Robert. I'll direct that question to Chris Catbaggin of the City of Santa Rosa. Sure. Uh, I can tell you uh, for this environmental phase, uh, there's money already been encumbered to complete the rest of this environmental phase. And some of that funding was due to uh, uh, gas tax, uh, capital, capital facility funds. And, and I, a big part of uh, uh, the source of funding came from SCTA through Measure M. Um, so again, I think I spoke about this earlier. Uh, the design, uh, it's already uh, going to be uh, programmed with money from uh, OBAG2, which is the uh, federal aid. And then uh, for the construction, uh, we haven't secured any funding, but we have an active uh, transportation planner who is looking at multiple sources um, that includes uh, uh, submitting applications to uh, other federal and state grants, such as uh, ATP, which is the Active Transportation Program. So we're going to try to do our best to uh, uh, to uh, secure funding and um, find other sources of, uh, of of funding. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Robert, for that question. Let me just lower your hand. Uh, I see a question in the chat. Let's see, a question is from Tom and Vicky. Uh, they ask, once all the comments for the ISMND are gathered and responded to, which agency will be the one to adopt the document? Uh, I will direct that question to Will Burns of David J. Powers and Associates. Yeah, so Caltrans is the uh, CEQA and NEPA lead agency for the project. So they will be the ones to adopt the mitigated negative declaration. Thank you, Will. I hope that answered your question, Tom and Vicki. Uh, it looks like you have another question. 
You ask, isn't SRJC required to provide the land for the bridge landing as the settlement for the lawsuit with the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition? Um, I will direct that question to Chris of the city of Santa Rosa. So you know that, again, I thank you for that question and I um, appreciate that, that concern. But again, I'd like to revert back to the meeting, uh, meeting's purpose. So uh, I highly suggest that you uh, take that comment and submit it as part of the circulation. Thank you, Chris. I hope that answered your question, Tom and Vicki. I see a question from Sterling Wallstrom. Sterling asks, are both alternative routes considered to both be built together rather than just one? I will direct that question to, who would like to take that question? Chris of the city of Santa Rosa. Can you uh, repeat that question one more time? Sterling asked, I want to make sure I understand. Are both alternative routes considered or possibly being considered to both be built together rather than just one? No, uh, we can go back to 2000 feasibility study, 2007. And the whole purpose of that study was to have a, a purpose and a need. And so now I jumped into the, the project initiation document where basically it, it's a Caltrans document um, where we scope uh, the actual project. We try to figure out the, the schedule and we try to find out where our construction money is coming. And so um, in reality, having two bridges, two bridges, two separate bridges built at the same time isn't feasible. It, it, the purpose would be served and the need would be served by just one. Thank you, Chris. We have a question from Meredith Kaplan. Meredith asks. Uh, Meredith would like to know more about the, if SRJC is is uh, supposed to pay for this project as well. Uh, I believe, Meredith, this is more of a comment. Um, I'm not sure if you have a specific question for the panelists. Uh, if it's a comment about SRJC um, as they're related to this project, please submit it in writing as part of the environmental process. Uh, Meredith's question is, is the SRJC supposed to pay for this? Uh, I will direct that question again to Chris Catbaggin of the city of Santa Rosa. <laughs> Thank you. And again, I'll, I'll mention that uh, I won't comment on that question. But again, uh, I highly suggest that uh, you forward this comment in writing and that way it will be addressed uh, with the final environmental document. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Meredith. I don't see any more raised hands. Again, if you have questions, please click the raise hand button or press star nine on your telephone if you are calling in. I have a raised hand from uh, Cynthia Parkhill. Uh, Cynthia, let me unmute you. Okay. Let's see. Let's see, I think Cynthia's coming on. Cynthia? Cynthia? Yeah. Yes. 
Um, I am wondering about will the bike, will the uh, multi-use path be patrolled by uh, bicycles? Uh, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, you, there was a little bit of an audio uh, interruption there, but I, I believe your question was, uh, will the multi-use path be controlled by bicycles? Um, hopefully that was your question. I will direct that question to Stephen Grover of SGA Architecture and Engineering. Uh, I'd like to request a little bit of clarification on the question. Um, can you just repeat it and maybe elaborate on it a little bit? I asked, will bicycle cops patrol the multi-use path? Bicycle cops patrol the multi-use path. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. I think that's a question for Chris. I think I would address that comment with uh, the understanding that the environmental document uh, has a set of studies and that's what we're addressing uh, today. That's what uh, the environmental uh, process is for. Um, I will say that uh, during the design phase, uh, there are agreements in terms of maintenance. So uh, I haven't had any discussions with uh, the SRG, JC or regarding security or, or any other residents, but I will say that uh, uh, if it's, Maybe I should ask, Will, Will, is there anything that addresses security concerns in, in any of these environmental uh, studies? Yeah, the focus of the environmental process is to look at um, physical impacts on the environment. So any sort of um, concerns related to, you know, patrolling of the facility or kind of outside the scope of the environmental review document. Thank you, Will. So with that said, uh, I, I suggest you uh, take that comment and submit it as part of the review and we will address it. Thank you. Thank you, Chris and Will, and thank you, Cynthia, for your question. Uh, I have a raised hand from Wayne Seddon again. Wayne, I will unmute you. Wayne? Wayne? Can you hear me? Yes, can you can hear see. me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Wayne. Oh, okay. The question was raised earlier about Jennings Crossing. Um, and um, uh, the question I have is if that were built out, I know the city is, has been trying for some time, Santa Rosa, to get that Jennings Crossing built. And if it were built, would that have any impact upon the study and uh, the selection of the best alternative? Thank you, Wayne. I will direct that question to uh, Chris Capagan of the city of Santa Rosa. Hi, Wayne. I was hoping to add to that, but uh, I may have to punt this and ask one of the consultants. Uh, again, uh, these are standalone projects. They function without each other. Uh, but if anybody else has anything to add. Stephen, this is Natalina. I, I believe the feasibility study uh, took Jennings Avenue over crossing in consideration. And the issue was the impacts on Jennings itself just west of 101. Uh, Stephen, could you elaborate on that or could you confirm that that's the, that's the case? Yeah, Natalina, I think that Wayne is asking about the proposed crossing over the smart right-of-way and not a crossing of 101 at Jennings. Oh, I, I am understanding, and maybe we could ask Wayne, I'm understanding if the crossing at Jennings and smart were to be constructed, whether that would influence the decision concerning a Jennings crossing. I see. I see. Um, no, I don't think it would because the, uh, frankly, the, 
the public right of way, the city of right of way at Jennings is so constrained um, that I don't even believe there are sidewalks there at this point. Um, so the amount of space available to put in a crossing there um, is, is quite limited and the impacts on um, quite a few residences there would not would make those residences inaccessible. Um, so to answer your question, uh, a, a new crossing at Jennings over the smart right of way would probably, would, would not uh, change the determination that a crossing at Jennings over 101 was non-viable. Thank you, Wayne. Are you are you there? Yeah. yeah, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, I just wanted to add that uh, there was quite a, a gathering of people at recent smart meetings, in which the residents on the other side, on the west side of Jennings, were very vocal in requesting that that uh, Jennings uh, overcrossing of the tracks, the smart tracks was uh, very much in their interest. So it seems to me that ought to be considered in uh, future discussions. Uh, thank you, Wayne. I believe that's a comment that you should uh, submit in writing. Okay, I will. Thank you very much. Let me lower your hand. Okay, I see a raised hand from Eris Weaver. Eris, let me unmute you. Hi, Eris. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm the executive director of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition, and I have an answer to a couple of previous questions. I've been digging uh, digitally through our files. And so the um, 2005 settlement between us and Santa Rosa Junior College did call for the JC to contribute $1 million towards the construction of the overcrossing. Thank you, Eris. I believe that's a comment. Do you have a question for the panelists? No, that was just my answer to some previous questions. Ah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, please submit a comment with, with that information. Okay, I see a raised hand from uh, Rick Coates hand. Rick? Uh, Rick, let me unmute you. Rick? Yes, uh, right. I understood Wayne's question to be entirely different from what you answered. Uh, I thought he was saying, would the presence of a crossing at Jennings weigh heavily in some way on the alternatives between Edwards and Bear Cub? Or would it make no difference? Yeah, that was the question. The that was the question that I understood and I, I tried to answer. And the answer was no, it would not make a difference. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Let me lower your hand. Okay. Uh, I have a raised hand here from Janet Barocco. Janet, let me unmute you. Okay, here we go. Janet. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Janet. You're a little bit faint. Okay, I stepped out for a moment, um, but I heard of the end of Wayne's comment about Jennings and then so, uh, one of the gentlemen, I don't know who it was, answered it would not make a difference. I was wondering who that was that said it would not make a difference to uh, if the crossing were to occur to either of the Edwards or the Bear Club way. And I was wondering if the gentleman can answer why that would not make a difference. Uh, I will direct that to Stephen Grover of SGA Architecture and Engineering. Uh, so the question that I was answering is whether it would make a difference 
um, of the determination we made during the feasibility phase of the project as to whether a crossing at Jennings of 101 was viable. And to that, um, my answer was no, the viability of that crossing would be unaffected by a crossing at Jennings over the smart tracks. As to whether a crossing at Jennings over the smart tracks would favor consideration of Edwards, Elliott, or the Bear Cub Way alternatives now, um, I would say I, I don't think so. Okay. Um, I, that's just interesting because on the map, I see that Jennings is still seems to be marked as a bicycle boulevard. And that was mentioned early on in this presentation, which it would allow access for people coming from the bus station, the, the transit area on West College. That was one of the advantages. They could, you know, come that way and people on the west of the tracks. And again, I made that comment early on, but I was told that that was not to be considered in this particular um, conversation. So, so this, this meeting is about the environmental review of two alternatives for crossing Highway 101. Um, and I think your comment is best directed to the people, the city staff that's man that are managing the process of a crossing of the smart tracks at Jennings. Okay, it just seems like a real straightforward thing to me when I look at the map, that's all. Okay. Thank you, Janet. Let me just lower your hand. Okay, I don't see any raised hands. Would the facilitators please check to see if anyone asked questions in the chat? Or if we missed anybody. Uh, Oscar, this is Jimmy. <clears throat> I don't see any other question. Okay, thank you, Jimmy. Uh, it appears we do not have any more questions, but we will keep this session open for one or two more minutes in case there are any final questions. Oh, I do see one coming in in uh, uh, Chris Zagorowitz. Uh, let me unmute you. Uh, Chris? Yeah. Um, um, I missed kind of the beginning, like all the, um, the introductions or whatever, but when this is going, if it goes through Bear Cub Way, does that mean we lose all the parking down there at the JC? Because that is there's a, a thoroughfare from Mando to Armory, and there's a couple parking lots in there. So are we going to lose that lose parking places as well? Thank you, Chris. I'll direct that question to uh, Natalina Bernardi of BKF Engineers. Uh, there will be disruption of parking um, during construction as well as permanently. Uh, for the Bear Cub Way alternative. Uh, there will be losses of uh, stalls. Um, and those stall, the number of losses will be minimized based on some rearrangement of the parking lot. Uh, and those, those, those uh, loss of stalls have been identified in the environmental document in order to assess the impacts of that. Natalina, may I just add that some of that loss will be due to new stalls having uh, different geometric standards. The new stalls will have to be larger. Yes, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen and Natalina, and thank you, Chris. Hope that answered your question. Let me just lower your hand. Okay, let me take a moment to have the Spanish interpreter check if there are any questions on the Spanish line.
Nope, no preguntas, gracias. Um, I see a hand raised from a call-in attendee. Uh, your last four digits, 6279. Um, I will unmute you if you could just announce who you are. Hello? Hello, yes. Um, this is Marianne calling. And uh, earlier, Erica and Frank called. I live uh, on Edwards Avenue. And my questions are totally different than I think everybody else has come across. Um, first of all, we're in a pandemic crisis. Second of all, we've had problems with people blocking the freeway. Um, if we have an overhead bridge, how many people are going to be coming over that are going to be possibly homeless because there's a lot of people that are. Um, I'm a senior. And also, when they have an overhead bridge like that, um, you know with this time that's happening, people are up there on the bridges. They could be shooting at people, killing people on the freeway. And I could think of better ways to spend money, like fixing potholes on the roads that need to be fixed. Are you there? Uh, that, yes, we are. Uh, that, that sounded like more of a, of a comment about security. Um, if you would like to submit that in writing, uh, that would be much appreciated. Um, I will allow uh, Chris to make any comments. I see a hand. Yeah, right uh, one, sure. Uh, once again, uh, that's similar to that security question. Um, unless something like this is disclosed as part of the environmental uh, studies, um, and be able to discuss more about this. But uh, again, I, I suggest you forward your question in writing and uh, so that it can be addressed. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for that comment. Uh, I see a raised hand from Robert Peterson again. Robert, let me unmute you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just have to comment on that pothole thing. I was almost killed riding through the Cottingtown underpass. And we're talking about children and schools. There's the elementary school up there on Cleveland. There's a high school. There's students going to the junior college. There's staff members using biking from the junior college. This is a, a safety issue here. And, and it's a terrible, terrible crossing area for pedestrians and bicycles. And people's lives are very important. That, that really angers me about potholes and taxes. That's ridiculous. Thank you, Robert. That uh, was the comment. Please submit those comments in writing so we can include them in the final environmental document. Let me just lower your hand. Okay. Let's see, we have a question from Andre Sidentov. Uh, Andre asks, um, Will the recording be available and where can Andre find the documents for this project? I will direct that question to Chris of the city of Santa Rosa. Hi, Andre, uh, Chris. I'd like to refer you to uh, the notification mailers uh, you received. On the bottom, there is a project website to our, uh, our project website for this project, and you'll be able to find past documents. You'll be able to find this draft initial study. And uh, I guess before uh, the end of this week, maybe tomorrow, uh, we will post this uh, recording of the virtual open house. And uh, again, uh, you may wanna uh, look at one of the notification mailers. Thank you, Chris. Andre, I hope that answered your question. I see that you have a follow-up question. Uh, Andre, you ask, is the Elliott option taking into account the new student housing? Uh, I will direct that question to uh, Natalie of BKF Engineers. 
at the time the environmental document was um, being developed, the student housing project uh, design development was not, ha had not been initiated. So the environmental document uh, considers existing conditions for prior to any student housing um, being considered in the area. Um, we are aware of it though, and we've been um, tracking its development and the project uh, can easily uh, be coordinated with that particular project. And in should Edwards and Elliott build alternative be chosen, the next phase of work, uh, the development of the design will need to coordinate with that particular project. Thank you, Natalina, and thank you, Andre. It appears we do not have any more questions, but let's keep this session open for one or two more minutes in case there are any final questions. In the meantime, um, the panelists may make any final comments about the project. This is Arnica with um, Caltrans. And I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to attend this virtual meeting. And I remind you all to submit comments during the public comment period. Okay. Seeing no more, oh, we do have a hand raised, final hand raised. All right, let's take one more question from Kritz uh, Zagorowitz. Chris, let me unmute you. Are you there, Chris? You, okay, we both do, okay. This is probably addressed at the beginning when I couldn't get in, but um, why are the extensions so far from the freeway? And I'm saying, I'm thinking of, there's a crosswalk down in Marin County. And it starts just to the sides of the, um, freeway. It doesn't extend all the way out to like uh, through Bear Cub Drive or all the way down to Dick's Sport, Sporting Goods. It wouldn't, the one in Marin County is much shorter. Is there a reason that it has to go as far as it does at, uh, rather you, than having the one that is like just it starts in a in a loop and goes across and then loops back down and that's it. It doesn't go out into the neighborhoods. Yes, Chris, I believe your question is about the geometrics of the uh, overcrossing. I will direct your question to uh, Stephen Grover of SGA Architecture and Engineering. Uh, I'm familiar with uh, a bridge uh, overcrossing in Marin with uh, spiral or circular approaches like you're you're talking about um, this type of design uh, emerged as uh, best practices um, in the middle of the 20th century uh, since then um, there have been a lot of changes uh, towards improving access for people with disabilities and improving separation and safety between fast moving users and slow moving users. So the geometrics of projects like this um, have evolved significantly so that they are much more open, uh, better sight lines, uh, more inviting, more comfortable. Um, this particular project, um, th there's, there's also limited room to wrap around on either side uh, but the short answer is, wherever possible, uh, 
we try to design these projects with straight sight lines and straight pathways uh, for safety uh, reasons. Uh, there's one other part of that, which is the slope. Uh, the preferred slope is as gentle as possible and 5% slope, which is one foot rise over 20 foot run wherever possible. Uh, and so that's what we've done. Those are current best practices. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Chris, I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Let me lower your hand. Okay, I've put on the screen uh, again how to provide input. And I did see a hand go up and come down a few times. Uh, Frank, let me just make sure. Um, Frank Haig, do you have a question? Let me unmute you. Are we there? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thanks again for getting back to me. Let's go back to the Edwards uh, Elliott uh, slide. There, now you notice right across from Dick's Sporting Goods and you have the West Access Point and that's when people get off or they get on. Now what happens beyond that? Because the sidewalk only goes up to those apartments on the west side of Dick Sporting's Goods. And from there on, there is no sidewalk up to range. So my question is, what are you going to do about that access? Uh, thank you, Frank. I believe you're asking about um, outside of the limits of this project. Yeah. But why don't I direct that question to uh, Stephen Grover of SG Architecture and Engineering. I think that's really a question for Chris. Um, ah, okay. Did he have plans to put in sidewalks there? Or to require sidewalks there? So, I think uh, the answer, before I, went, I say anything, um, it would make sense to actually have a sidewalk uh, and a uh, continue on with the, the bus going. But before I can confirm that, I, I suggest you put that in a comment and we will address that. Well, I would hope that you would have this in the comments anyhow. Will you, my question, is that gonna happen? Again, I, I, I don't have confirmation of that, but my guess would it be continuation of that sidewalk. But again, I. I asked you to put that in a comment so it is uh, certainly addressed and confirmed. Uh, Chris. Chris, I think there's um, some cities looking at the overall bike and pet facilities in the area. And so we, we may want to ask that gentleman to leave his name and contact information so we could direct him to uh, others in the city that may have further information on projects outside of these limits. Well, that'll be fine with me and I can give you my name and uh, address. Uh, my concern basically is you're dumping people off of that overpass down to the west access point. Where are they going to go? Up the street? Are they, what is the, what is the pedestrian problem there? if there's gonna be a problem. So uh, again, I would say uh, overall, there is a, a 2000, I think it's uh, a recent uh, bike and ped master plan. And it, it shouldn't mention this, but again, uh, uh, let me, uh, let us confirm that. And if you can again, send a comment focusing on this and we can address it. Okay, how do you want to get back to me? Uh, uh, there are multiple ways you can submit a comment. You can submit a comment uh, through email or you can write a letter all before uh, 
July 24th. All right, let's put that slide back on for how people can submit comments and provide input. There you are. I, I see that. Okay, uh, I'm, I, I don't think that you guys, when you've designed that, particularly from the city standpoint, have addressed where you're going to take people from that west portal going off the overpass onto Cottingtown or Range or whatever. That's my question. Hello? Yeah. So again, this is Chris speaking. If you can address that letter and that comment or particular question, we can uh, address that within the final environmental document and confirm that we give you the, the, the proper response. Okay, I understand. So you, you have not, I'm, I'm going to take that response that you have not considered my question or the concern of where those people are going to go after they get off that overcross on Edwards. Is that right? You, you just ended it right there? Uh, this is Stephen. Um, we are aware that the project, in fact, it's a requirement of Caltrans that any project like this connect back to the public right of way. Cyclists would go on to Edwards Avenue. Um, my understanding um, is that there would be a Shero, uh class three bicycle access and I'm just looking at Street View on Edwards Avenue, and I've confirmed that there are indeed sidewalks on both sides of, of Edwards Avenue. Yeah, but um, way up to the post office, you see. Okay. So, this, so I just um, want, I, this is a very important comment, Frank. Um, and if you provide it as a question verbally here, uh, it won't get into the formal review process. So what Chris was saying is I, I strongly encourage you to submit something, even if it's just in the chat here in writing, so that it will be formally considered and addressed. So my question is not considered formal at this point. Is that correct? The verbal questions are clarifying questions. If something's considered formally for the environmental review process, it needs to be submitted in writing. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Frank. All right, I don't see any more raised hands or questions. Uh, it is eight o'clock. Seeing no more additional questions from attendees. Uh, let's close this question and answer session. Thank you for all your questions and thank you to our panelists. Right, this thank you. Online public meeting for the Santa Rosa US Highway 101 bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing project. The draft environmental document is currently available for review and comment through July 24, 2020. Thank you for attending and we hope you and your families stay healthy.